Start our F5, you're looking at exponential function is a function that has repeated multiplication. So all of our linear, it was always adding or subtracting the same thing. Exponential is when we are going to be multiplying as we look at that. So it says an exponential function with a base b is defined by y equals b to the x, where b is greater than 0 and b does not equal 1. b is a constant. It is an independent variable and um, where the x is the domain of our real number. So what kind of inputs can we have anytime we are looking at an exponential function? Our domain is going to be all real. If I asked you for the range of this one, the range would be everything greater or equal to zero because my y values are everything above the x-axis, right? So thinking about the domain, that would be all of my x inputs. I can put in any x. It says in the example at the right, the value of b is 2. So we have f of x equals 2 to the x. That refers to the common multiplier. So a lot of times if you're multiplying by 2, we say something's doubling. So that's a common vocabulary that you might see. So if they tell you something's doubling every time period, that means we're taking it times 2. It says you also might refer to it as a ratio in successive terms because we are going to be looking at sequences again. So it says, remember, exponential functions grow by a common factor over an interval. It's always going to be repeated multiplication. Always, always, always repeated. So this next screen, there's a lot of vocab again on this one. Yeah, Erica. Sure, I have some back here too if you want to grab one more again. So here's key vocabulary. A parent function that we are going to be looking at is going to be y equals b to the x. The other exponential function that we are going to look at is going to look like this. So just like in our linear, we had y equals mx plus b for our parent function, or y equals x. Our parent function here is going to be y equals b to the x. So there are four parameters in the function that can be changed. The x and y variables are always going to be the same. So we're always going to keep the y and x. It says the description below for algebra 1 will most likely work for the a and b parameters but not always for the H and K. So when we look at this, where the H and the K are, those are going to be just a little different. So when you are looking at these, so it says the A is always our initial value. That means it's this number that we are taking a look at. So Y equals, so if we are looking at the initial value when X is 0. So if I would plug in 0 for X, 2 to the 0, some of you got mixed up on the quiz yesterday, anything to the 0 always equals... One, I had a few zeros. Or I had some people work out that really ugly one, right? But if we are looking at this, 2 to the 0 is 1. So 3 times 1 minus 1 gives us 2 for this case, right? So it says A is a value, um, cannot equal 0. That value, because um, or else we have a linear function. So if X is 0, then we're going to have a linear function. Or if our A is 0, we're going to have a linear function. Typically, this is the same as our y-intercept, unless you have an h or k value that is not 0. If a equals 1, we usually don't write that down. So a lot of times you will notice that they might just say y equals 2 to the x. They don't put 1 times 2 to the x. The b is our growth or decay. It's what you're multiplying by. b must either be between 0 and 1 for decay or greater than 1 for growth. This is key. Make sure you highlight or look at this one right here. The B, knowing when it's growth and decay, when B is between 0 and 1, that's your decay. When it's greater than 1, it's growth. Greater than 1 is what? Growth. Between 0 and 1 is? Decay. 0 and 1 is what? Decay. But greater than 1 is always going to be growth. So when you look at those equations, it's important to look at that. So the H, and again, remember, the H and K are not always going to be something we have to be too worried about in our algebra. You're not going to see those too much. It says it shifts the graph to the left or right. A negative H value moves the graph to the right, and a positive H moves it to the left. So kind of like when we were thinking about our absolute value as we looked at those, we always have a zero for a parameter in algebra 1. If H equals zero, we usually, again, don't write that. And if those aren't working, just throw them away. The K shifts the graph up, so if we notice this one, the K value, this plus K, that's going to shift it up or down if we are looking at it. 
Um, it tells us where the horizontal asymptote is. This is an imaginary line that the function approaches the closer and closer but will never reach. In our class, it's usually going to be zero when k is zero, and again, we're not going to write that down. So when we are taking a look at this function, if a is one, right, this is how my graph is, but if I increase that, notice how it makes my graph steeper, but it doesn't change that it's approaching zero, right? If I make it smaller, and if I make it negative, it makes it go down below the graph, okay? So I'm still looking at the domain as I'm looking at that. My domain is all reals, but the range is what's going to change. So if the B is at 2, and I'm increasing that, again, it's going to make it much steeper. If that B gets closer to 1, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be like a horizontal line. If it gets negative, right, then we're going to flip, or if we're getting decimals, you see how it's going to be decaying. So when the B value is between 0 and 1, this is a decaying situation. Whenever B is greater than 1, it's a growth. This is going up. So looking at the H value, again, and if you're putting in an equation into the decimal calculator, if you put it in with all letters, down below you can have these and then you can kind of play so that you can see, like if you get this, if I keep changing the K, what does it look like? So you can see how that changes if I'm looking at it. If I wanted to look at, okay, and I'm gonna put this back to, and if I look at this one, and again, if I wanted to change that and see how it changes it to growth, as I'm looking at that one. And so you can do the same thing as you are looking at yours and you can put these in. And if you look at your equations and you put them in in this way, it kind of lets you have an idea where, how these things change and how they affect it. Um, I would like you right now, we're gonna go to the next page in your notes. So on the top of that next page, we are gonna be looking at those equations. So when we take a look at a linear table, the difference in a linear table is that we are always looking that we will have constant addition. As the x increases by 1, awesome, you can just set it back this way. As the x increases by 1, the table is going to show, excuse me, repeated addition in our y column. Now, could that repeated addition be adding a negative number? Yes. What is our equation for linear? y equals mx plus b is the most constant one. What does the graph look like? It should be a nice straight line. The difference when we look at our exponential is that we are, instead of as x increases by 1, the y column will not be repeated addition. It will now be repeated multiplying. And when we think of our repeated multiplying, it's usually by a common ratio. So you're always multiplying by 2. You're always multiplying by 3. Could you be multiplying by 1 third? Yes. Could you be multiplying by a half? Yes. So it's going up or going down. Our exponential equation that you want to write down, y equals a times b to the x. And the graph is either going to curve up or it's going to curve down, like we just saw as you were looking at that. So. It's always curving up or it's curving down as we take a look at that. So we are now given these different equations. So, so when we write an equation in exponential form, sometimes we leave off the A because A is understood to be 1. Sometimes we leave off the H and K if they are equal to 0. The most basic equation for an exponential is going to look like this, Y equals B to the X. And this is the one we use the most. So if we are taking a look at these different equations, what I would like you to do is label the A, the B, the H, and the K as you are looking at them. So keeping in mind, if I look at this first one, I would say that my A is 2, right? The 3 is my B. In this case, I am looking at my H and K 
And so if I am looking at the H and K in this one, my K is going to be 5. Does that make sense? Do I have to identify the H if it's 0? No. This is our only H where we have a value, and the H here is actually going to be equal to 3. Right? So this K was equal to 5, the B was equal to 3, and the A was equal to 2. If I'm looking at this second equation, as I take a look at that, Fred, what do you want to think are, do we have an A value? So that A or B is for the 4. Mm -hmm. So my B in this equation is 4. My A would have been 1, right? You don't have that written in, so 1. If I am looking at Bennett, what other variables do we know? The plus 1 back here. Okay. So my K is also going to be 1. So if we are looking at that next one, please write, if you have your A, your B, as we are looking at that. And really, in this one, we should only have an A and a B, right? I should have what A equals, and I should have what B equals. Shelby, which one do you want to give me? B is equal to 3, which means my A is 1, right? I'm not going to have an H and a K. They are both understood to be 0 in this case. If I'm looking at this last one, as I take a look at this, um, Maya, I'm going to have, which variable do you want to identify first? Mm -hmm. A equals 2. So if I'm looking at that, Lindsay, what are we going to have for our B value? 6. And I already identified my H as 3. And Jim, the negative 4 or the 4, would it be negative 4 or 4 for my K? Okay, it's going to be negative 4. Because it's usually plus of K. So in this case, negative 4. If I was looking at this, this one would be growth. This would be growth. All four of these are growth. Why? Because what we're multiplying or taking to a power is a number that is larger than one. Yeah. Why does H equal negative two? Why is it equal to what? Negative two. Uh, because the original equation, if we look back here, x minus h plus k. So it's kind of like when we did our um, when we did like vertex form. Of our equations is always x minus h plus k when we are doing point slope form. Okay, so next you're just asked to identify is it linear or exponential, right? So in a table, if there is not repeated addition, and in this case it looks like repeated multiplication, we are going to say exponential. The graphs are the easiest, right? So if I'm looking at this one, this is definitely a linear. If I'm looking at my other graph over here, Rowan, what would you say? It would be exponential. If I look at my equations, right? So in the equations, if I have an exponent, that's kind of the key for exponential. So as I look at my two equations, Jaden, what would you say this one? Linear. Kind of that form of y equals mx plus b. Um, if I am looking at this other one, Casey, down here, what would you say? Uh, that is definitely going to be exponential. And the key thing is we have an exponent, right? So as you are looking at that. As I look at this table, as the x increases by 1 from 3 to 4 to 5, it looks like what is happening, Jethro? It's adding 3. Yeah. Yeah, it's adding what? 3. Adding two each time. So this table would be linear. And if I'm going as my x increases here by one, my y's, what is happening? It looks like we are multiplying by uh, three. By three. Because we started at negative one, so we get negative three nine. So this is going to definitely be exponential because we are multiplying. Okay, that makes sense with your list code. So you're going to be asking your homework to identify linear or linear or exponential. But then you're going to be asked to graph, and I will be handing out graph paper, and it says on the board on page 457, 20 to 29, you need to make this XY table. So when you do question 20 to 29, this is what you want to do. You're going to write down your equation, and either on the front of your graph paper or on the back of your graph paper, you are going to make a table of values from negative 2, 
negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Sometimes we'll go from negative 3. But if we are looking at this, we are going to be thinking about putting 3 to the negative 2 power. Now, using our exponent rules, if we were going to keep this as a fraction, 3 to the negative 2 would be 1 over 3 to the second, or 1 9. If I'm looking at, and someone said, well, why are you putting negative 1? Because that's what x, my x value is. So remember, this equation is y equals 3 to the x. So if I would put 3 to the negative 1, remember, that's equal to 1 over 3 to the first, which is just 1 third. Anything to the 0, 3 to the 0 equals 1. 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 to the second, 9. 3 to the third, 27. Now, if you think about the negative 2 and 2, they should always be reciprocal. The 1 and negative 1 should always be reciprocal. So if I wanted to put negative 3, I know it should be 127. It should be the reciprocal value by this. So it says as we look at the table, what pattern do we notice as we are looking at this? So if we, we're going to be graphing these. So one of the things when we do go to graph this, but if we're just looking at the pattern in this one, one of the things that I had to write down for our pattern, um, if we are noticing that there is repeated multiplication, it's times 3 as you go down the column. The key feature is that it is exponential, and you always should see repeated multiplication when I am looking at an exponential function. And the key thing is, is when you know your zero term, that's kind of giving you what you multiply by. So we're going to do another one where we graph. Um, but this one, when you set your scale for graphing, I just want you to notice that it's almost always going to be in the first um, on the top quadrant. So if I was going to graph this, when I graph this with my y and x, right, I'm going to have my negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 2, 3. But my scale here is going to be different. Like my scale here, I might go 3, right? Then I have 6, and I have... What I'll have some people do is they'll go 1, 3, 9, 27. No, you can't do that. We actually want to see the curve. So at negative 2, it's 1 ninth, right? Then it's 1 third, and then it's 1. Well, this is 3. Well, 1 is going to be like down here, right? At 1, it's at 3. At 2, it's at 9. So this is where you can definitely see this curve, right? So when you set your scale, make sure as you are looking at those for setting your scale. And we have another one where we practice. So it asks you to match each one as we are taking a look at these. So if we are matching, one of the first things is, is I want to look at my growth. So growth means that I multiplied my B value had to be bigger than 1. So in this case, I am looking at C and D as my growth. If I look at this first one, this first graph as I take a look at it, it looks like, should it be C or D, would you think? It has to be C. Why C? Because the A is 1, right? And it's going up. Which means if this first one is C, if it's just the reciprocal of that going down, that's going to be over here. And this one should be D. This is my DK. Definitely looks DK. And it has a positive 1 and it's going to be the one-half. So this is going to be my A, which if I look at this graph, it is just like it's reflected over, and that's what that negative one does. It reflects it over, so that's going to be your B. When you look at these, the key thing is, how do you know where your Y-intercept is represented? The Y-intercept, as we look at that, is always going to be our A value. Okay. So when I looked at this one, here negative 1, this looks like negative 1. Here positive 1, here negative 1. How do I know if it's going to be um, where the base is represented in our equation? That's going to be the B value that you are multiplying by. So the B value that you're multiplying by. That last part, big questions, 20 to 29. 
you're going to make this table. When you think of your x values, usually negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We don't want to get much further away from that y axis because then the numbers get really huge or really small. The easiest one should be your zero to figure out, right? If I'm figuring out what is anything to the zero power, in this case, we are going to take that 0 0.5 times 3 to the zero. 3 to the zero is 1. 1 times 0.5 or 1 times a half is 0 0.5, right? So we have 0 with 0 0.5. That means at zero, my y-intercept is right here at 0.5. Now, it doesn't matter which way you go from there. You can definitely use your calculator and get decimal answers, right? So take your calculator out. If you don't have one, grab one. Um, if we are looking at this one, we are taking 0.5 times 3 to the 1. That means I'm taking half times 3, right? So 0.5 times 3, half of 3 is 1.5. Don't need a calculator, maybe for that first one. You might need it more for your negatives. So at 1, I am looking at 1 and a half. Now you notice that the scale, they didn't go up by 1, they went up by a half, so that we can see our pattern a little better. When I have 2, I'm going to 0 0.5 times 3. And remember, you are replacing the x with a 2. So 3 squared, you got to do exponents first. 3 squared is 9. Half of 9 is... You need your calculator, half of 9 is 4 and a half, right? So at 2, we are up to 4 and a half. We can definitely see the curve. We want to accurately plot the points over here. So on your calculator, 0 0.5 times 3 to the negative 1. 1 half, 0 0.5 times 3 to the negative 2. If I am looking at those values, and again, I probably put them as decimals, what are we looking at, Sierra, for the negative one? What'd you get? I didn't see it. So put 0. 0.5 times 3. You might either be using the caret key if you have it on your calculator or the y to the x. Make sure you get used to using your calculator so on the day of the test you don't come and go, hey, Mrs. Thompson, on your calculator, how do I do this? Make sure you know what you get. For the negative one? Oh. 0 0.16 and then the repeating. If I'm looking, Ava, at the plugging in negative two, what'd you get when you got negative two? We were plugging that one in. Okay, so put in 0.5 on your calculator, times 3, raise it to the 2, make sure that it's negative. It should be way smaller than that. Because these are definitely getting smaller. At negative 1, it was 0.16, right? And you got... Get it, Alana? Uh, 0.05 and repeat. Make sure you can get that on your calculator. Did you get that? Okay, so I'll help you. You want to make sure you know how to put those in so when you're doing it today. So when I'm looking at this one, right, and it's approaching, getting closer and closer to zero, but it's never going to hit zero. So if I asked you what's your domain, the domain for this is going to be all real numbers. What is our range? Our range is going to be everything greater or equal to zero. So the A and the B. The question is what effect do they have on our equation? When we think about this, the A is our y-intercept. So the a is our 0.5, it's our y-intercept. And the b, because b equals 3 in this case, it is telling us it is growth, and our equation, our line, is going to curve up. So because that number is greater than 1, if it was equal to 1, it's actually linear, right? But if B, in this case, because it's greater than 1, it is going to be growing, okay? So the A and the B, they affect our y-intercept, and they affect if it's growing or decaying, as we are looking at that. 
because it's a repeated multiplication of three, it should be going up as you look at that. So as you are looking at your homework, make sure that everyone has that. There are, um, we're pretty much done with notes for today as we look at those. But if you look at your notes for the next couple days, tomorrow we're going to exponential growth and decay. We do, um, and then we get into um, modeling that. And then the next day we are getting into geometric sequences. So we go to sequences because they fit exactly with doing the multiplication or with our exponential. So your textbook assignment is page 457. The first one, you just start out in 813, and you tell me linear or nonlinear, and you say why. Should be pretty easy. You're looking for repeated multiplication or repeated addition in a table, exponents with the equations, um, and they didn't give you any graphs. This is going back to function notation. Some of you might have forgotten when we did function notation before. When you're doing function notation and I'm doing question 14, I'm looking for f of 4. So I'm going to put this whole problem on my paper. You're going to write this down. And then right below it or right behind it, you're going to put f of 4 equals. And you're going to put 6 to the second. And then you're going to put in 6 to the second, which is 36 for your answer. So your answer to the problem in number 14 is going to be f to the 4 equals 36, and you'll do it like that to show your solution. You're just replacing the x value with 2. Here you're replacing the x value with 3 in front of these. Here you're replacing t, so as you look at those. Here are some different problems looking at investments, but you should be able to look at those time periods. These are your graphs. So you want to spread them out. You want to make a table of values. When I look at your table of values, I should see negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Ava, question? Why is the x by the x form so small? Say it again. Why is the x by the x form so small? Alice should have been 4. You're right. Should be 6 to the 4. Or 6 to the... This should be a 2. So f to the 2, 6 to the second, okay? You are doing 1 to 29, or 8 to 29 as you are taking a look at this. If you do have questions, 